and welcome to Undercurrent, where you can find out what's been happening around Perth this week. I'm Lucy Marchant. On Saturday the 22nd of October, the Bonjour Perth Festival will take over the Ozone Reserve Park in the city for a day of French fun, food and culture. All of those involved in the festival gathered at the Novo Hotel for a special evening to celebrate all of the hard work they've put in to make this amazing festival happen. Bonjour et bienvenue. Tonight we're at the Novo Hotel in Perth to celebrate all of those involved in a Bonjour Perth Festival. Champagne and canopy on the menu and everyone's having a great time. Justin, you're the co-organizer of this event tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're celebrating tonight? Uh, what we're celebrating, it is the uh, second year of the uh, Bonjour Perth French Festival. Uh, we did it last year for the first time uh, just to celebrate France and the French speaking culture and um, we got 13,000 people to the event. Uh, we're hoping to get more this year uh, but it's really just a, a chance for the French community, the Australian and all communities to get together to celebrate things that are French whether it be food, dance, fashion, cars, everything. The Bonjour Perth Festival is going to have numerous stalls. Can you give us a little taste of what to expect in these stalls? So as you know, the French are well known for their food, so we've got a lot of food stalls. Um, we've got a very large car display, a fashion show. We have a VIP premier class and we have um, a lot of sporting activities and kids activities. So basically there's something for everybody. And I think a lot of people don't realise how many French people are in Perth and not just the French, but the French speaking countries, there's quite a diverse community when it comes down to it. And it gives those communities a chance to celebrate once a year, and it gives the rest of the larger community a chance to look into everything they have to offer, which is amazing. The Bonjour Festival started last year. It was a very big success. Uh, and this year is gonna not only on the French language, but spread it across the French communities, New Caledonia, of course, Quebec. And so it's bringing a bit of French to Perth. Lightning, bringing culture, language, and these festivals like this bring the French culture to Perth. It's very important. The Bonjour Festival is fun, it's lively, and it brings Western Australia to the rest of the world. And what can we expect from tonight? Tonight, basically, it's uh, an evening uh, organized to thank all our sponsors, partners, and the media for supporting us for the second edition of the festival. So we had over 12,000 people coming and joining us uh, last year for the um, first edition, and um, we had a very good, uh, warm welcome from all the community, and the Australians were very happy, so we can say it was a huge success. Having as much excitement as we had last year and uh, happy people, happy stalls, happy visitors and that's, if I get this, and creating a bridge between the Australian culture and the French culture basically. Uh, tonight has been amazing, we're really pleased about you know, having all these amazing people with us. It's very important for the festival to be able to thank and acknowledge all the partners. Um, so we're really happy that everyone turned out tonight and we can't wait for the festival to happen. At the festival I've been uh, looking after um, crafting all the entertainment program as well as preparing some of the kids program. So we've got an amazing program on the main stage all day long live music. We have roving acts throughout the festival and we've got as well a series of dance workshops throughout the day from morning to late in the afternoon. I've been involved in the festival end of May so at first it was like two days a week it was not too bad but like since a couple of months it's been every day it's very stressful but very exciting you know it's just like you've been working so hard on something you can't see anything about it and there's just everything happens in one day can't wait to see it and just want them to tell me at the end of the of the day that was awesome we'll be back next year but how did you get involved with the bonjour Perth festival well, they came to us and offered to help us to raise money so we were amazed and can you tell us a little bit about your charity yes so we feed the poor and uh, we befriend the poor and we look after school children and uh, elderly people, that's what we do, we care for people. We have over 200 wonderful volunteers who make Manor work. And how do you feel about how tonight's going? 
to have a French cultural festival is fantastic. What, what do you love about France? The food. Everyone loves the food. I love the cars. I think their cars are amazing. I think the fashion's amazing. Uh, I would say the food would be the first one, and um, the fashion, uh, the wine and the food, yeah, of course. Well, really, the food, the wine, the cultural experience. Everyone's had a wonderful time here tonight at the Novotel Perth to celebrate all of those involved in the Bonjour Perth Festival, which is happening on the 22nd of October. You can expect some food, some wine, and a lot of cultural events. Thank you very much, Lisa Martin for Undercurrent. This week, we asked the people of Perth what they think of foreign workers. Do they help fill jobs that nobody wants, or do they take jobs from Aussies in need of employment? Let's find out what you think. With WA being the second highest in unemployment rates, is it fair that employers are looking for overseas workers to fill local jobs? Apparently, they're saying that local employees are too picky. They won't do the night work, they won't do the shift work or the weekend work. We're hitting the streets to find out what people in Perth have to say about that. Are they looking for jobs locally? Are they willing to do the hard yards? I don't think people here are picky. It's the truth is we need more jobs here. That's what I feel. Even though I have a higher uh, master's degree, I have 10 years experience in banking, but still no interviews, nothing. There's a lot of supply and not too much demand, I suppose. I think that might be the problem. Um, there's a lot of people getting university degrees and, you know, um, everyone's got a degree now. So I think everyone's kind of struggling to get that that component that really sets you apart from everyone else. Being of a young age they want people with experience and I'm just struggling because I'm only just fresh out of school. Um, I'm trying to get jobs to get in like my foot in the door so yeah it's hard. <laughs> I think also the same because um, it's been very hard for us. I had to work in a different, a totally different sector now just to get the local experience everyone's asking for. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, local job seekers being too picky? Perhaps they don't want to do the shift work or the long hours? I think it's hit and miss. You have some who definitely you know, would rather have the nine to five, um, but there's definitely plenty of people out there who work the hard yards. I have lots of friends who work weekends, nights, miss out the time they would normally spend with family and friends just to make money and get by. Uh, for me, I can do the, sh the long hours. Even I can work in the weekends. Uh, but nobody's giving me the chance to do that. If you uh, were offered a job as a waitress or a kitchen staff, would that be something you'd be interested in doing? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's where I've been applying. Like, as long as we get the opportunity, that's all that we would ask for, I guess. <laughs> so what do you think about these employers that are looking for overseas workers from Europe and from Asia um, to, to employ them here as our waitresses and, uh, and waiters and kitchen staff? I think they should gear more on local hiring more local people than going overseas because there's a lot of potential there's a lot of skillful people here with talents so they don't need to outsource anywhere yeah that's not really fair to be honest yeah i feel like we should be because we want to gain more experience and we should have the like, bit, yeah really yeah because we want to get our foot in the door in the industry i I think it's a bit wrong to be putting others before your own people, I guess. I think young people are willing to work for the hard yards and study. People want to buy a house, it's difficult enough in the economy. Ideally, you want to keep the work, you know, domestic and, you know, local, um, as opposed to, you know, shifting more of our domestic wealth overseas. So, you know, I definitely think they should keep it local. I would definitely support um, jobs, jobs going to our local people. However, those skills have to be kept up for what employers are seeking and need to keep their skills very relevant in today's market. Bast Hadros for Undercurrent. Make sure you stay with us because we'll be back for more Undercurrent after a short break. Welcome back to Undercurrent. Spring is upon us and as the sun comes out of hibernation, so have the snakes. Elise Van Aken meets with local vet David Neck to find out how we can keep ourselves and our pets safe from snakes. I'm here with Dr David Neck, the spokesperson for the Australian Veterinary Association. So it's the start of snake season now. What makes the snakes come out this time of year? 
Well, it's the beautiful warm weather. It's the start of spring and snakes are cold blooded, so they don't really move around when it's winter time. Out comes the sun, out comes the snakes. They've been doing nothing but sleeping for a while. They're hungry, their fangs are full of venom, so they're ready to go and they're probably in a slightly bad mood with a headache. So they're out there looking for trouble and that's why we need to be especially careful with our pets at this time of the year. What time of the day are snakes most active? Snakes are cold blooded, so they actually have to warm up before they start doing too much. So in the early morning, they're not out, they're not doing much. But by the end of the day, when they've been basking in the sun, laying on a warm rock, they're out, they're going. And so it's in the afternoon and early evening that we'll mostly encounter the snakes. In Western Australia, we have two snakes. We really have the dugite, which is from the brown snake family, and we treat that one as a brown snake toxin. And we have the tiger snake. Uh, the tiger snake probably tends to be more around swampy wetland kind of areas. The dugite we can find literally anywhere at any time. Where's the most likely place we'll encounter snakes? Typically we'll find them in bushland. They are a bush creature and they do like the bushland, but we'll really find them anywhere. Sand dunes, backyards. The snakes will be out and about looking for things to eat. Rats and mice are one of their favourites. So if you've got a cluttered backyard with lots of wood piles and lots of places for the rodents to hang around, you're probably going to be attracting snakes to your own backyard. So worth tidying up the backyard at this time of the year to keep them away. How can we spot which snakes are the most dangerous to us? I think in Western Australia, a snake's dangerous. Just take it as dangerous. Now, the snakes are not out looking for trouble. In fact, they're quite the opposite. They don't like a lot of company around them. So if you make a lot of noise, just give them some clearance. They'll take their own path and get out of your way. So if you're out bushwalking, sing one of those bushwalking songs. They'll hear you coming and they'll get out of your steps. With your pets, keep them on a lead and keep them close by, or take them to a place to exercise where they're not likely to meet the snakes. Don't go out in the bushland, go to a big park with lots of short green grass and you'll be able to see the snakes from 100 metres away and stay away from them. And what should we do if one of our pets is bitten by a snake? So if you suspect there's a snake bite, if your dog is found with a snake and you're not sure if they're poisoned or not. The poison travels in the pet exactly the same way it does in people, which is in the lymphatics. So anyone who's done first aid in humans knows you put a broad compression bandage on the limb and stop the person moving the limb so that they don't spread the toxin in. With our pets, we don't really know where they've been bitten, so it's a bit harder. But what we don't want to do is have them moving around too much. So if possible, put them in a cage and transport them to the vet in a cage. That will slow down the movement of toxin into their bloodstream and slow down the onset of the signs of poisoning. The poisons are really what we call a neurotoxin. They affect the nervous system of the animal and so they go wobbly in the back legs. That's the first sign you'll see. It's almost like a drunken walk and they go wobbly from the back end going forwards, getting weaker and weaker until they're fully paralysed. In the later stages of poisoning, unfortunately, it paralyses the respiratory muscles and that's how the patients die. At the same time, the snakes have a toxin that literally starts to digest their prey. It's how they eat their food and don't have it rot inside them. Snakes are cold-blooded, so they've got to find a way to digest their food pretty quickly. And medically, we have a lot more problems with that part of the poison than we do with the neurotoxin that's affecting their nervous system. So how are the pets treated by the vet for the snake bite? The treatment that we're looking for is anti-venom. That's the uh, product that we take basically by giving horses little bits of snake venom. The horse mounts an immune response to that snake venom. We take out some blood from the horse, spin it down, and the proteins left behind are what neutralises the toxin. We give that into the bloodstream of the cat or the dog to neutralise the snake poison. Unfortunately, it's a horse product, and we're giving that directly into the bloodstream of the cat and the dog, and we can get some reactions to that at times. It's called anaphylactic shock, and it's pretty terrible. Let's try to prevent our snake bites, then treat them once it's happened. I guess the key messages are exercise in the cooler times of the morning rather than in the afternoon, exercise in open spaces where you can see snakes from a long way away, and clean up the clutter in the backyard, get rid of rats and mice, and then the snakes have no reason to come into your property. Robert Juniper was an artist with an incredible talent, known for his abstract paintings of the Western Australian landscape. His art is being displayed at the Gombok Gallery this month and Angela Albuquerque went to have a look. I'm here in Middle Swan at the Gombok Gallery to look at Robert Juniper's work in a celebration exhibition, which is celebrating this iconic West Australian who has work around the world and is an important artist for Australia and Western Australia. This is not an original quote from me, but, but he taught us to see the Australian landscape. I think there are um, very few artists who 
of his generation who have painted the landscape as it as it is and and been able to depict its real beauty rather than sort of superimpose something on it that it, that wasn't really there. He taught us to see and to enjoy the slightly scruffy, as he used to call it, Australian landscape. I would describe his art as beautiful and highly eclectic. I, I would describe him as an artistic genius. I would say that because I'm his daughter, but I'm also one of his greatest fans and I'm not alone in saying that. He was an artistic genius. It's a tribute exhibition, a celebration of his work. It's the first time all of his prints have been seen together in one place and a fairly significant collection of his paintings too. A sufficient time has passed now since, um, since he left the place. It got to the stage where we sort of really needed to do it, celebrate his work and his life. They've been in storage or they were in his old gallery up in Darlington. A lot of these prints weren't framed, so They've been in file drawers and wrapped up in sort of acid-free paper. Sorting through them and finding suitable framing for them, that sort of thing, it's been a bit of an epic sort of thing to do, but a good celebration, as I say. Once you start looking at the work as a whole, in a, in a collective sense, it, it really speaks volumes about his prolific nature of his work and the many styles that he's embraced and also the breadth of his artistic vision, you could say. Obviously this is a, a large gallery and it had to be presented at a large gallery because there's a huge amount of work here, I think 91 individual works. Apart from the one-off originals, he got a lot of limited edition prints which are, which are collectible. We are the owners of his intellectual property, so that is heritage from that point of view. And my sister and I are both professional artists, so that sort of goes on through the generation. And my brother and my older sister have helped to sort of collate all of this stuff. Quite a huge undertaking. And this is just two-dimensional work. There's, there, you know, he made many sculptures too, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Robert Juniper was such a wonderful West Australian artist and landscape ar artist of the Australian and West Australian landscape in particular. And I think it's wonderful that so many of his works have been brought together in the one exhibition so that uh, so many people can come and see this really important retrospective of his work. I've known Bob since I was 18 and uh, we had a, a, a long and continuous friendship. We talked about many things, he helped me in many ways. We collaborated on a few jobs. Bob was a continually inventive person. He was a very elegant speaker and an and elegant writer. You know, I really enjoy working with Bob because I've learned a lot from him um, and he just simply appreciated my skills that I've learned from other, doing other, my own work, you know, because there was always a juggle between um, doing some work for Bob because there was a sort of a, a bit of a financial gain in it for me where when I make work on my own sculpture that you only get the reward if you sell it so um, so we, we were juggling all the time and uh, as I said working with Bob was an absolute pleasure. Yeah I think he'd be really proud I think he would enjoy looking through this work because it really is a breadth of his career so there are quite, some quite early works here through all his periods. It's fascinating, I, I'm still fascinated by it as well. And the prints are just amazing. When you see a range of work like what we have on the walls here today, you can really see that clearly. I think he'd be proud of himself, and rightly so. Probably a, a man who has a great love for the bush and the outback and where we live, sense of place. This is the first time I've seen it hung, so it's great. It's, yeah, it's really beautiful to see it all up and displayed where it should be, because yeah. So, and, and, and that's what's really lovely, I think, is seeing such a breadth of his work displayed all together. I guess Dad sort of instilled a, a love of nature in all of us because he, we did spend a lot of time in the bush and he had a great love for the West Australian landscape, as you can see in his work, and that sort of, that was sort of passed down to all of us kids, I guess. Yeah. I do fly in, fly out, and flying over the, you know, flying over the Midwest and that sort of thing is, definitely looks like Dad's paintings. He's a great father. Um, very entertaining, very sort of happy, happy boy. I mean, you know, God, he loved his life. He was doing something that he re really loved doing. But, but yeah, very happy sort of man. So, you know, you can't ask for more than that in life, I suppose. I'll come and see it while it's here. It's on for a month. It's very eclectic. And particularly the drawings are very rare. They haven't been seen by very many people. Aquatints, serigraph prints. So there's a great range of things here to see. I'm Angela Albuquerque for Undercurrent. The Leukaemia Foundation helps thousands of Australians who are diagnosed with blood cancer. Last week they held the Light the Night fundraising walk. Let's have a look. Every two hours in Australia, someone loses their life to blood cancer and many are diagnosed with it each day. That's why thousands of people around the country are walking together in solidarity tonight for the Leukaemia Foundation's annual Light the Night fundraising walk. 
Perth's one is taking place tonight here in UWA. Tell us about your role at the Leukemia Foundation. Um, my role is twofold. I'm the general manager in Western Australia. So I oversee our fundraising side of what we do and our support services side of what we do. So it's a bit of a dual role. How do you feel seeing hundreds of people here tonight for this course? Oh, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for the Leukemia Foundation tonight and you sort of look around and in some ways you feel a bit upset because we haven't found a cure for what we do. But tonight it's all about giving people hope for the future. What do you hope to get out of the Lantern Walk through UWA tonight? Well, all through Australia tonight we've got lots of uh, Light the Nights and we're hoping to raise close to $2 million through all the Light the Nights in Australia. Tell us about some of the work that uh, the Leukemia Foundation does to help Australians beat blood cancer. Okay. Um, the Foundation provides a range of practical services and resources uh, to people living with blood cancer. So the practical services are things like transport to get people to and from treatment at hospitals. We have accommodation for regional people. So if you live in a town like Esperance or Albany, there's no treatment in those towns, so you have to come up to Perth. So you stay in one of our accommodation units. We have a range of emotional and practical support that we provide as well. From a research point of view, that's about giving hope to people into the future that we can find a cure one day. How will the Leukemia Foundation benefit from every fundraising effort around the country? Because every dollar is going to count, so are certain amounts allocated to certain projects or treatments? or The money goes into where we think the best fit is, so that's a combination of looking after people undergoing uh, blood cancer treatment and people and some funds will go into research from tonight as well. Looking around the scenes here at UWA, there are people with blue, white and gold lanterns. So what's with these lanterns that people have got in their hands? Right. The lanterns are very symbolic, so um, it's called Light the Night because what we do in about an hour's time, about 7 o'clock when it goes dark, we raise the lanterns and we go for a walk. So the blue lantern is to support someone or to remember someone that's going through treatment. The yellow lanterns are, um, are for someone that's passed away and the white land is for those people that are going through treatment at the moment. Tell us about this um, process over here where people had to register to take part in the walk tonight. Okay, because um, it's a fundraising event we do encourage people to raise $100 for the night um, and then with that $100 then they get a lantern that's given to them as part of the walk. Um, so people might turn up as well and if they just turn up on the night they can buy a lantern for $20 and that all goes into the fundraising. How have people in Perth and around Australia been fundraising for the Leukemia Foundation? Oh, it's pretty cool what people do. Um, from tonight, the fundraising is as simple as people selling different shoelaces, different t-shirts, hats. We've had a lot of people that are baking cakes and goodies to sell. Um, it's very much up to each individual. A lot of times people might just have a barbecue at home, they might charge the mates five dollars, and every dollar that comes in adds up. Here in WA, um, what has 2016 been like in terms of diagnosis, treatments and so forth? Unfortunately, in, over the last year or two we've seen an increase in blood cancer in Western Australia and at the moment we have 25 people diagnosed each week, which is up from 23 a couple of years ago. We don't really understand why that is. It might be that our healthcare system is getting better at diagnosing people, but we're not, we're not really sure. Tell us about the journey that you've been going through and how have the Leukemia Foundation been any help to you at all? Okay, so I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in May um, and that was a, obviously it comes to a big surprise at, uh, for everyone, but I just went for a random checkup with my GP and um, yeah, she mentioned that I needed to have a few further tests and then a week later she mentioned um, that's not very good news and so within a week I was seeing my specialist and then a week after that I started my first round of chemo. How have people been supporting you as you're going through this very difficult time? I'm really blessed to have a really amazing family. My family have been so fantastic. They've really supported me, uh, but also the wider community, the Leukemia Foundation as well. They've had a, a great support uh, to me. Um, I really enjoy attending their events and I'm really happy to be here tonight with my family and my friends that have been with me on this journey to really be able to give back and yeah, raise awareness for people that do have been diagnosed with blood cancer. Are you motivated also to help others beat blood cancer as well? Definitely, definitely. I guess because I've been on my own journey myself, I'm, I'm really passionate about helping other people do the same. People gathered here tonight have come to remember those who have passed away from blood cancer and to support those who have been diagnosed by the disease and the work that the Leukemia Foundation are doing. Michael Sir reporting for Undercurrent. 
Thank you very much for watching Undercurrent. Don't forget to catch up with us online at wtvperf.com.au. Take care and we'll see you next week.